There was an event at the library whose all Bristol and an expert in nonsense. So <laughs> those, uh, th those are our speakers tonight. And uh, I should just mention, I think B said in her introduction, if you have a question about anything we're going to be talking about, there is some time at the end of this event where we're going to be uh, hopefully answering your questions, or rather I will be taking your questions and fielding them over to the actual uh, Lear experts, the Learographers, and hoping that they will be able to answer them better than I could, which is pretty much guaranteed. Uh, finally, there is a special treat we've got, none other than Dominic West, uh, the actor who has recorded two newly discovered Lear poems as, uh, as a treat for us. And those two poems were discovered by Amy Wilcoxon in the British Library. And she is, uh, she is gonna be joining us in a minute. She is actually at the British Library desk right now where she discovered those two new Lear poems, which was uh, enormously exciting. She discovered them last year. And um, so we're, we're going to be talking about that shortly. Dominic West has, uh, has recorded these poems for us. And I believe we can now go over uh, to uh, to those readings by Dominic now. Over to Dominic. The last of the octopods. From Monte Generoso, when the leaves were turning brown, 500,000 octopods all painfully came down. And on the back of every one, a pofflicop held fast. And all their faces, dark or fair, with sorrow were o'ercast. For months ago, 8,000 babes had greedily partaken of red raw beef and brandy buff with curried owls and bacon. And, said the doctor's octopod, there can't be any question that all these little innocents have died of indigestion. They sent for 90 elephants from Palmy Travancore, and when the elephants arrived, they sent for 90 more. Upon those elephants, they tied the coffins all with hay. And on each coffin strapped a duck to quack throughout the day. And then adown the mountainside, all slowly they descended, till at the gates of Great Milan, the vast procession ended. To Milan, as the sun went down in clouds of rosy flame, those octopods and pofflicops in dust and sorrow came. Four million of stout Lombard men came out to meet them all. They said, we cannot have them here. Our city is too small. And so they dug a fearful hole, the city wall beside, and all the pofflicops jumped in and quite oblivious died. 
500,000 octopods in tears, all pale and thin. Likewise, the coffins and the ducks were thrown promiscuous in. And lastly, all the elephants, majestically sad, jumped on the top of all the rest with shrieks and grunts like mad. And as the Lombards filled the chasm, they clashed their spades and said, of octopods and poplicops, of ducks alive or dead, of elephants with tusks and trunks and skins all brown and rough, of all these things, the Lombards sang, thank heaven, we've had enough. Icicle bicycle. There was an old man on a bicycle whose nose was adorned with an icicle. But they said, if you stop, it will certainly drop and abolish both you and your bicycle. Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed to Dominic there. So uh, to, to, to start things off, let's speak to Amy, to Amy Wilcoxon, a PhD researcher at the University of Nottingham, who, um, who discovered uh, these, these poems, these undiscovered, uh, previously undiscovered lyrics. works, uh, while looking through paperwork at the British Library. And Amy, can you tell us a little bit about the discovery, about what you were looking for uh, <laughs> and about what you found and how you found it? Indeed, yes. Thank you so much, Andrew. And thank you uh, to the British Library for running this event today. It's so exciting to be here. Um, and I am actually in the British Library, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, in the very seat where I um, found the Leah manuscripts and the lights have just gone off in here actually, which is very, <laughs> uh, very atmospheric. Um, so I am doing a PhD currently at the University of Nottingham, um, but I am not studying Edward Lear. Uh, my PhD is on a Scottish romantic poet called Thomas Campbell, um, who I'm sure you've all heard of. Uh, no, he's, he's, he's not very well known <laughs> at all. Um, and it was through looking uh, for one of Campbell's letters that I came across these Leah um, documents, these Lear manuscripts. So there's a huge four volume uh, collection here in the British Library called the Charnwood Collection. Um, and it's, it's the autograph collection of a lady called uh, Lady Charnwood, um, who collected all these wonderful manuscripts together and gave them to the British Library. Um, and as I was looking through this collection for one of Campbell's letters, um, I came across uh, this wonderful looking poem with the intriguing title, Lays of the Octopods or Last of the Octopods. Um, this wonderful spidery handwriting that I'm sure, you know, we all recognize. Um, and I just started reading and, uh, and thought it was absolutely hilarious. I was uh, laughing out loud here in the reading room, which is not something you're uh, supposed to do uh, <laughs> in the quiet of these rooms. Um, I started reading down, I flipped the page and there at the bottom, uh, was the signature Edward Lear and as you can imagine I was completely astonished. Um, I'm a big Lear fan, I'm not sure about expert but I'm a big Lear fan and I had not um, seen or read this um, poem before which made me sort of think that I'd perhaps come across something rather special. Um, my colleague Dr Edmund Downey was also in the British Library and I ran over to him and asked him to come and have a look um, at what I'd found um, after I'd done a bit of sort of internet searching I thought I think I think this is something really exciting um and he said to me have you seen if there's anything else in there um I was just so excited by this I didn't even mm. think to turn the pages to keep looking um so I turned the pages and then there was this obviously wonderful bicycle icicle libric that, that Dominic West read there so beautifully um it's very typically Leah sort of pen and ink caricature um of an old man doing something dreadful as they tend to do in his limericks um <laughs> carried on flicking through and uh, there was also a, a letter that hadn't been published before which contained a leah uh, self caricature of himself which we've also got a picture of and again this is this is so typically leah you know he's got yeah, he... a big bushy beard he's quite rotund got his little, little glasses on um and he's he's done so much traveling he's actually got swollen swollen feet um that's what we can see there um so yeah, it was just so thrilling to, to find these things. Um, there's actually six of these um, of Leah's manuscripts in the Charmwood collection. Three of them were published by Lady Charmwood in some books that she'd written, uh, but these three hadn't been published before. And I think that's kind of why they slipped under the radar. Um, they weren't mentioned in the catalogue at all. The, the, the lady who was mentioned in the catalogue was Mary Mundella, 
and I think they've got one of Leah's envelopes um, to Mandela. Um, and Mary Mandela, who Leah wrote to, who Leah sent these, this limerick, this poem to, um, was the daughter of a liberal MP called Anthony John Mandela. Um, and he was actually the sheriff of Nottingham, which is a nice link to me, um, in Nottingham, <laughs> which I rather enjoyed when I, when I found that out. Um, and yeah, she intended to write her father's biography when he, when he passed and she collected all the papers together, all the, um, the, the letters from famous people they were writing to, um, Tennyson's I think as well. Um, and then she bequeathed them to her niece, who is Lady Charnwood, which is why they're in the, the Charnwood collection. So that's the kind of family link there and how they ended up um, in the British Library. Yeah, it does, I mean, it, it's, um, it's very exciting because it does, it does make you wonder what else might be there just lurking in collections. Right. I know. <laughs> I, to ask a completely tangential question, and we will get back to Lear in a moment, did mm -hmm. you find the Campbell letter you were looking for? I did find the Campbell letter, yes. Oh, good. It, was, it was actually some, some pages before the Lear uh, <laughs> okay. stuff. So if I wasn't sort of flicking through, it was a very sleepy afternoon. It's about, uh, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon in the British Library on a Thursday, I think it was. And um, it was that time in the afternoon where concentrations maybe dropped off a little bit. Absolutely. There's, uh, you know, there's Jane Austen letters, um, Lady Mary Wortley Montague letters, Alexander Pope. Um, all their letters are in this volume. So I was flicking through having luck for those as well. And that's how I came across the Leah, um, which is, yeah, so exciting. But it's yes, I did find fabulous. the Campbell. Oh, it's it's just wonderful. Congratulations, Amy. It's really it's, oh, it's just great. And then you alerted the Lear authorities, I imagine. Uh, <laughs> you authority. contacted the central body. Uh, yes, I'm sure there is a Lear central body somewhere. Uh, <laughs> yes, the piece was published. Uh, myself and Ed Downey published um, these pieces in the Times Literary Supplement, and then um, that made its way into the national press uh, from there, which was extremely exciting, as you can um, imagine. Uh, and yes, and then I'm, I'm just thrilled really that the, that the pieces are kind of um, being read because I think that's what the, I mean, Leah's so evocative. We've all read, I think we all know The Owl and the Pussycat. Um, I remember my grandparents giving me a book of poetry and that was the first one in there when I was younger. And, you know, I always think of Leah very fondly uh, from that. So, yeah, I just want people to, to read them really and, and the, these beautiful images as well to be, to be out there. Yeah, it's kind of, um, it's, it's kind of almost, um, sumptuous the, and kind of, you know, supernumerary. The sheer number of images, new words that that throw themselves at your attention, especially when the poem is being read to you, you know, and you're you're not controlling the pace, if you like. And so I, I want because I think I think you're right in saying that Lear is chiefly remembered in the public uh, eye today as the author of the Owl and the Pussycat and the Limericks. But there was so much more to him. Um, but interestingly, the the two discoveries that you made, the the icicle limerick, um, obviously, uh, matches up with the public imagination of him. And I wanted to ask a bit about the octopods as well, because I wasn't very familiar with the octopods. And am I right in saying it's his vision of um, irritating tourists? It is, yes. And Sarah's written on this um, quite a lot, I think. So Sarah's probably a good person to also ask about this but yes um, to quote Sarah he use, uses octopods as an insult uh, for vulgar crowds at hotels um, direct quote there from Sarah um, yes and he he writes at this time a lot in his diaries and in, in letters about octopods and uses this um, quite a lot he wrote um, the octopods and the reptiles which is another another of his poems around the same time I think as uh, the last of the octopods um, I've got some I've got some quotes written down that he writes in his diary. The horrible noise made by octopod children is acutely horrid. Um, so you know he he consistently uses uses that word um, for irritating tourists. Oh, that's interesting. Well, we we are we are going to get onto the nonsense and a, a bit more on the octopods in a bit. Um, I I was just um, wondering about the the kind of dis discovery um, element of this particularly in light of the fact that so much of Lear's paperwork was destroyed after his death. Uh, am I, I think I'm right in saying that by um, a man with the unimprovable name of Franklin Lushington, uh, who, who Lear seems to have you know, fallen in love with and, and, and uh, carried a torch for for many years. Um, so did that add an extra piquancy to the discovery? The fact that you know that, a lot of Lear paperwork is now no longer extant. It's not as though there's a beautiful concordance of absolutely everything he ever said or wrote. 
yeah it's 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 just I think it's exciting to find anything like like this I mean I think it was a for me a once in a lifetime thing I think probably you know we might not find more Leah stuff again I guess and I was very much in the right place I think at the right time and it's only as I said through kind of knowing a bit about Leah as I say I'm not an expert um but through knowing a bit about Leah that I realized um what this was um I think Sarah will be talking about uh, Leah's music as well and the fact that he, he, he composed his own music but a lot of that um, has been lost um, so yeah it's very exciting to to find some things find new things that haven't been uh, haven't been found before yeah it's uh, well it's fabulous well I'll tell you what with that with that in mind um, let's cut now to uh, a little bit more of Jimmy McNulty himself, uh, Dominic West, uh, who I believe has recorded a few. He's going to be popping up a few more times throughout the uh, throughout the evening. So he's recorded a, a several more limericks for us. And let's now uh, go to the next batch of limericks as read by Dominic West. Dominic? There was an old man of Dumbry who taught little owls to drink tea. For he said, to eat mice is not proper or nice an amiable man of Dunbree. There was a young lady whose chin resembled the point of a pin. So she had it made sharp and purchased a harp and played several tunes with her chin. Lovely, thank you very much again, Dominic. And uh, he'll be back, he'll be popping up again later with a few more of Lear's uh, most loved limericks. So uh, now, Sarah, if I can bring you in. Sarah Lodge, you are a senior lecturer in English at St Andrews. You're the author of the book Inventing Edward Lear. You have organised uh, an exhibition on Lear. You've organised concerts of his music. Um, you, you are steeped in Learography. Um, so just to, to start off, were you, were you excited to, to learn that there was extra Lear suddenly in circulation when this news broke last year? Absolutely. We're all in, in Amy's debt. It's enormously exciting. And, you know, there are, as, as one rare book salesman said to me, there are pieces of Lear's in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I love to think that there are actually more. I mean, he wrote lots and lots of letters. Um, so to find Lear letters is not entirely surprising. As he said to himself, he wrote to everybody except the Venerable Bede and Mary Queen of Scots. He wrote literally thousands of letters. But to find a new poem, two new poems, is pretty extraordinary. We now come to the second of um, Lear's multiple hats, because I wanted to talk to you a bit about Lear's uh, musicality. Um, and I know that he composed music. He provided the settings for the works of other poets to be read, uh, particularly Tennyson, is that right? Yes, he actually published 12 settings of Tennyson's poems, and Tennyson was very fond of them. They're very good, um, uh, particularly Tears, Idle Tears, which is really emotional, really quite operatic. Mm -hmm. And we know he, he set many other things as well. There are at least nine other Tennyson poems that he set that we don't have the music for. He set some Swinburne, he set Shelley's poems. Um, so he, he really, he's a very active musician uh, all his life. He played in youth and um, he played the flute and the accordion and the small guitar, just like the owl and the owl and the pussycat, which is sort of I've not actually seen a small guitar in real life, but I gather that they're a bit more like a lute. You know, they, they're, they're, they're slightly different from what we think of as the guitar. But mostly he played the piano and sang. Those, those were his main instruments, as it were. You've um, procured some of his, uh, some clips of his music. And I wonder, should, should we start with those and then, and then talk a bit more in general about Lear's musical life? Yes, if uh, any way you like. Um, the, the two clips, well, the first one is is the Yongi Bongi Bo, just the beginning of the Yongi Bongi Bo. And, and some people watching tonight will know this as a poem, but you might not have heard it as a song. And really my hot take is that all of Leo's poems are songs. Um, in fact, most of the longer poems we know had music and he sang them at the piano. It's just really sadly... The music has been lost, partly because Lear didn't read music formally. He just played by ear. So unless there happened to be somebody by to transcribe them, they were simply in the air. They were airs in the air and, and they That's just didn't tragic. survive. It's kind of sad. And, and yet there's also 
something compelling about the fact that they're live, you know, that being Leo, Leo was an entertainer, you know, a little bit like Tom Lehrer in the modern world or somebody like that, somebody who could be on the piano and could be playing something very, very serious and solemn and then could make it really funny. He, he, he was a very live entertainer in that way. Um, but yes, if you'd like to play the, the clip of the Ongi Bongi yeah, Bow, then yeah. you'll hear a, a little of what I mean. That, that was Edward Robinson, who's a, a lovely young baritone, and David Owen Norris, uh, who many will know as, as a pianist, um, sometimes pops up on, on Radio 3. We, we actually have sort of made it our mission to record all of Lear's extant music, and it's been a fascinating process because we have those 12 Tennyson songs and then some of the nonsense songs. He also, um, when he travelled, because he did travel writing as well, um, he actually recorded songs as best he could um, from the different regions that he was traveling in. And so in his illustrated excursions in Italy in, in the 1840s, he actually put songs at the end of the book. So, you know, you, you not only accompany him visually and verbally into these regions at the end, you can actually play the tunes at home, um, which is kind of extraordinary. It's a sort of radio experience in, in, its, in its own way. Um, and the Onky Bongy Bow is, it's very much you know, that tragic comedy that Leah does so well, that it's it's like an opera in a sense, you know, of, of this um, funny little man, little hoddy doddy, um, who falls in love with the Lady Jingly Jones, but she's already taken um, on the coast of Coromandel where the early pumpkins blow. And so it's a tragic romance, a romance that cannot be. And yet it's also just really funny. And when Leah describes, um, saying it or singing it to his friends, everybody's falling about laughing. So clearly they found it hilarious. Um, yeah, and it's it, it's funny because in a, in, a, in a slightly later age where the jokes are maybe not uh, flagged as clearly, or they're not, they're, it, you know, for a start, we're, we're, everything's coming through a few layers. Uh, what, you know, one is of time, the other is it's not being performed for us, as you said it would be. Um, it's sometimes harder to tell this, balance between uh the comic and the tragic because Lear, i mean Lear seems on heaps of levels to have been quite unhappy in a, 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 a number of areas in his life and yet he's constantly producing uh, light joyful nonsensical verses and music um and he's also always as you say darting around between media i mean he, he painted what was it something like eight thousand paintings he produces as you say thousands of letters poems, the limericks, especially in his 20s, he's constantly darting around between different areas and there's constantly a, a, a slight tragic element mixed in there as well. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, I, I'm... Leo suffered from depression. Um, and one of the, the kind of refreshing things is that he was really quite open about that. He called it the morbids. And he was able to talk about that with uh, Tennyson, who also suffered from depression. Leo was very clear that he'd suffered from it since he was a, a very small boy. And when he'd gone to see a, a fairground at the back of his, his home, 
uh, in North London. And after it was over, there'd been a good, good music. Often music is really associated with emotion for Leo. There'd been wonderful and acrobats and this kind of thing. And then after it was over, he sobbed, you know, and for days, you know, there was a sort of depression that followed it. And I think we often have the sense of Leo as a rather tragic figure, as a figure of pathos, partly because that was mediated by his friends and uh, those those people who who were his sort of early biographers and collected his letters and Leah's letters are full of moaning. <laughs> this is a kind of specialist subject. But actually, if you look at his diaries and you look at his writing and his output, he was also often very exuberant as well and scarcely lonely in the sense that he had all these hundreds of friends. So I think we have to take a slightly balanced view of this kind of isolated figure that that is often portrayed um it's interesting because that, that's certain i think that's certainly the imagination that the, 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 the image i had of him in my mind I, I i kind of quintessentially victorian uh you know frothy ebullient very extremely creative but also prone to as you say absolute fits of the morbids and one of his something he wrote he, he wrote i see life as basically tragic and futile and the only thing that matters is making little jokes uh, now that may have also been a little joke of his, as you're, as you're suggesting, or it. It, it depended what it day it was. It, oh, gosh, he's one of yeah. the very, very first people to talk about a kind of emotional barometer. You know that he talks about his moods as being like the weather that they go up and down, and he was very aware that he was also epileptic, and and he he could feel his fits coming on, which meant he he was able to conceal his epilepsy quite effectively he from other people. I read that he just sort of dashed out of the room. He just hurried out when he felt an epileptic fit coming on. Yeah, I, I think he, he often had them in the evenings, actually, and, and, and in the nights, and that sort of helped in a way to, you know, that, or, or if he, he felt that it was going to be an epileptic day, he would just sort of keep his chambers, as it were, and, and not mix uh, with other people. He certainly had um, notice, as it were. But I think because, you know, his mental health and, and his epilepsy were, were connected and he was very aware of... of of his whole body and mind as a kind of sensorium that was constantly changing. Um, he, he was able to, to kind of um, think of his emotions um, as a state that was always, that was always in flux. Um, and he conveys that, I think, in his poetry, that his, you know, even the nonsense poems that we love um, but like the Jumblies, for example, you know, it's a beautiful poem, an incredibly consoling poem. And yet there's also a kind of sad undertow, a kind of counterpoint in the music that is about loss and longing and childhood being a kind of place that we can't go back to, you know, that you can go to see in a sieve in a kind of magical thinking, but only for so long, you know, you can only bear it for so long. Um, do, you th do you think that might be one of the reasons why his reputation and legacy are so assured and why he remains popular today because that he has this rather modern understanding of of himself and of all of our emotions i think he reaches out to us in a very very modern way that you know we are all Leah's friends in, in a sense you know we're, we're amongst you know those people like the venerable Bede and, and mary queen of scots who, who he's always <laughs> reaching out to and and because his poems are in fact songs they are intrinsically catchy they they stay with us even if we don't know the music even if the music has been lost i think the fact that they are musical they're, they're lyricism or, or as he called them lyrical <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it makes them stay stay with us um, in an interesting way. This is Leo, Leo again caricaturing. It's sort of <laughs> accurate to the extent that that, he, that you notice there's no music. He's just playing by ear. Um, it's quite sweet. And then you can see, you know, how much music there is in um, what he calls his pussy and owl song. So the the owl and the pussy cat. The the owl is playing his guitar. There's a there's an old oh. man of the Isles, uh, okay. one of the Limerick characters, um, who sang he, hi dum diddle and played on the fiddle. The amiable man of the Isles. And then the owl and the pussy cat in their pea green boat with nice. the owl with more guitar singing. And then the dong with a, with a luminous nose, who in this very strange illustration by Lear, he's, he looks like he's playing a kind of trumpet or a horn, um, as well as um, illuminating the landscape with his, his very peculiar <laughs> protuberance. Um, 
I, I, I love that picture of him playing um, the piano, just as uh, the earlier picture that Amy showed us of, of, of him depicting it. I mean, he wasn't concerned with glamorizing himself, was he, in his letters? There's no, <laughs> there's no illusion that, uh, that he might be, you know, in, incredibly handsome and uh, unbespectacled. And I mean, the thing you, you wouldn't expect is he was actually really tall, particularly for his era. He, he's tall and broad-shouldered broad and actually is quite attractive, um, though he always thought he had a very big nose. But in his early character caricatures of himself he, he's always a string bean and then at some point in middle age he becomes this little kind of plum pudding figure with, <laughs> with legs it's interesting God, that's fascinating um okay well i'm sure we'll come back to all of that and i'm sure we'll come back to um more depictions that, that Lear made of, of himself and and uh for that matter his his paintings um but now I, you know, I hear a tapping at the door. Who's that? It's Dominic West again with a couple more limericks. So let's go uh, right over to Dominic now for the next two. There was an old man who said, hush, I perceive a young bird in this bush. When they said, is it small? He replied, not at all. It's four times as big as the bush. There was an old man of Nepal from his horse had a terrible fall. But though split quite in two, with some very strong glue, they mended that man of Nepal. There was an old person of Ware who rode on the back of a bear. When they asked, does it trot? He said, certainly not. He's a mopsican, flopsican bear. Fabulous. Thank you once again, Dominic. Um, and so now we come to the uh, the kind of the nonsense element, which we've already touched on briefly, obviously, uh, of Lear's life. And so it's uh, a great pleasure to introduce our third, uh, I'm going to say Learographer, I'm going to stick with it. Uh, so Noreen Masud, you are a, a lecturer at the University of Bristol. And I, I do actually want to read out your uh, description on the uh, your agency's website, because I find it so magnificent. You are a literary scholar working on the 20th century, writing about things which, in one way or another, present variously as absurd, unrevealing, embarrassing, or useless. And uh, I think that's magnificent. I think we've all we've all felt like that. We've all felt <laughs> like that. Um, and so th there is a, there is obviously a, a huge relevance uh, to Edward Lear here because you know absurdity is is almost the whole shooting match for him, really, isn't it? Yeah, it's some um, it's an interesting one because um, I work on things which sort of um, some of the things I work on cast themselves as nonsense and know that they're absurd and unrevealing, uh, and then I work on other things which aren't really absurd or unrevealing until you look at them closely. And what I'm one of the things I'm always thinking about with Lear is 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 that that way that he moves between the absurd and the very lucid and the kind of the useless and the useful. Um, I think one of the things I like best about Lear is that he. His, his, his nonsense poetry, his nonsense writing um, is special, I think, um, even in comparison to other contemporary nonsense writers like Lewis Carroll, um, because I think all of it is engrossed in the big question of how we live alongside other people. And I think it tackles that question with that huge sort of existential question very, and it, throughout his work and, and very seriously. Um, and it offers sort of two sorts of answers for that. There's an easy one, uh, but there's also a slightly more difficult one, a more difficult answer for how we live alongside other people. Um, and the first one he offers is a sort of dream of a place where different things, things which don't fit anywhere else, can get sort of resolved into harmony, uh, like the owl and the pussycat from two different spheres of life, or in another poem, the duck and the kangaroo, um, or the quangle wangle's hat, um, where all of these strange beings gather on a hat. Um, and um, and live together, you know, and, and it often resolves into a kind of dance, or it ends up in music of some kind, as, as Sarah talked a little bit about, that music or dance is a way of absorbing people and creating a kind of harmony. So it's a sort of dream of a place where everyone can find a rhythm alongside others, um, and outcasts can find harmony with each other. So that's the easy thing answer that Leah gives for how we live alongside other people. Um, and it's really appealing. Of course, we love the image of everything dissolving into a dance. Um, but there's a, something more difficult that he also suggests. Um, the, the question of how we live alongside other people when it's not harmonious, 
when it doesn't resolve into something easy and neat and smooth like a dance. Um, because to an extent, I think Leah knows that this dream of harmony is just a dream. And the reality of living with others is, is seldom so easily. It's seldom so easy. And you talked a bit, Sarah, about how um, he wasn't lonely at all. And often I think he had many more people than he quite knew what to do with. He's off, always <laughs> lamenting that he's got these visitors he doesn't want. He just wants to be <laughs> left alone. He's got to dine with people he doesn't like. Um, there's all of these sort of jarring interruptions in his life and some of them are human some of them are things like his fleas he's always com he complains at one at one point there's several diary pages where he's just devoured by fleas and suffering with it um and so all of these sort of jarring jolting things were always happening to him and his epileptic seizures um being one of them and sometimes he did have warning as as we've discussed but there are other times when they come on really suddenly and he doesn't know where they've come from and he describes them as very sudden in his diaries, this idea of the sudden comes up over and over again, suddenly came to awful grief, that's one of his seizures. Um, and I think he finds suddenness quite alarming. Um, there's a limerick, um, there was an old man of Ibrim who suddenly threatened to scream, but they said, if you do, we will thump you quite blue, you disgusting old man of Ibrim. <laughs> um, and I think we, I have quite a lot of sympathy for this, this they, who threatened to thump the old man of Ibrahim for screaming, because it's difficult to live alongside people who suddenly threaten to do things which jar you or which you don't like. Um, and Leah struggles with this suddenness, but at the same time, I think what's really remarkable is that he welcomes this sort of jolting difference into his world, even though he finds it difficult. Um, I've got a diary entry here from 1873, which I really like, which shows a little oh, bit of how nice. he deals with this. Um, home to dine but everything from unknown causes was later than usual. Also, Foss the cat suddenly ate up the new cream cheese. Also later, the lamp abruptly extincted himself. I meant to have written to Frank, that's Frank Lushington, who you mentioned earlier, um, from whom I've not heard from an age, heard for, from, for an age, but it's getting too late, too late. I, I just love this sort of, um, this sort of uh, panoply of nonsense creatures that Leah conjures into existence in his way. You've got the lamp who extincts himself and the cat who eats up a huge cream cheese before Leah can stop him in, in one go, suddenly. Um, Foss in general, this is his cat, Foss, who, who's this rich source of sudden shocks. He's always creating jolts <laughs> in Leah's world. So what this is, is one of uh, Leah's sort of, um, this is in the, the uh, Harvard Library. It's, it's a sort of one of the flyleaf of one of Leah's books. And you can see these two huge ink blots on it. And it says, two blots on Corsica. Oh dear, 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 Mr. Edward Lear. Foss did it. We have a lovely picture of Foss there. So obviously Foss jumped suddenly and upset the ink pot and sent it flying and made blots. Um, so we've got this suddenness in Leah's life and in his cat, who he adores, he adores Foss um, and welcomes into his life. Um, but also he fills the limericks with this, these acts of suddenness as well, like the old man of Ibrim or the old man of the Leghorn in, a, in another limerick. It's quickly snapped up. He was once by a puppy. Um, and I find this contrast really strange because if we look at Leah's diaries, they show that he's terrifyingly committed to, to orderly routines. I, he, he almost every day just skips lunch. He starts work early, early in the morning and just works for hours straight the way through. Um, just just um, really abstemious, really hardworking. Um, but I think maybe that's why Leah really loved these sort of abrupt, impetuous pets and characters because they're acting on on instinct a sort of animal tendency which he really loved um and i think leah's interested in the way that things just do act out their sort of inevitable idiosyncratic lovable natures it's part of their charm and and you know the the impetuous suddenness of the old man of ibrim who suddenly threatened to scream yeah, I mean, we have, we're torn, I think, in that limerick. Do we have sympathy for that they who, who are really bothered by it? But we also, I think, have sympathy for the old man who was just called upon to do something that he can't sort of not do. And fundamentally, I think what's interesting is we never know why these creatures in Lear act the way they do. We never know why the old man of a dream suddenly needs to scream. Um, but I think the, for Lear, it's, it's exactly this unknowability of these motivations which makes them lovable um 
they, they all come, all of, all, you know, Leo is fascinated by place names, long, exotic sounding, multi-syllabic place names. They hear all of the others, all of the, the unknown creatures in Leo's poetry come from these foreign places and they have motivations which are sort of necessarily foreign to him and priorities, priorities which he doesn't share. They move at different speeds from him. They make decisions he doesn't understand. Um, and you can't control that and you can't change that. All you can do is sort of brace against it or, or tolerate it and sort of admire it. You certainly can't absorb it into a kind of harmonious dance all the time. It's just something you have to sort of live with. And, and Leo is always negotiating that, the, a whole lot of different feelings about that. Sometimes there's a kind of resignation to suddenness. Sometimes there's a rage about it, as we see, I think, a little bit in, in the wonderful new poem, The Last of the Octopods, um, where, you know, there are too many octopods and so they all get thrown into a pit and buried because we've had enough of them. Leah snaps sometimes, I can't bear it anymore. Um, but sometimes there's this joy in the kind of suddenness and the abruptness of others that we can't understand and we can't absorb. And it it says, no, we can't, it, doesn't demand a kind of comfortable communal safety that's really important I think it doesn't it's under no illusions that that's what we always get sometimes living alongside others involves just constantly negotiating those different feelings about it all the time never quite relaxing um and I think I think what's really remarkable about that is I I, I feel like that that's a sort of way of thinking about otherness which has never really been more important I think, even though, you know, not, Leah's, Leah's writing is very funny, very entertaining, very charming, but actually a kind of mode of relating to difference, which doesn't expect it to be easy, which expects and doesn't demand that it sort of blends in with you. The idea that other people or other creatures are always going to have priorities, which maybe we can never understand, ways of doing things which we can never understand. And actually what's sort of demanded of us, you know, from in sort of so many walks of life, and I think particularly here about things like the refugee crisis, what's demanded of us is to live alongside difficulty and difference, even when it challenges us. And yeah, I think that's what's amazing and unique about Leah really interesting and I, I wanted to ask as well about the because uh, as you say a lot of the limericks and and, and the poems they present um strangeness suddenness mm -hmm. violence upheaval um but particularly in the limericks obviously the the limericks that he wrote are unusual by modern standards because you don't typically end with the same word uh that the first line ended with whereas Lear that's a I think a universal thing I don't think there are any modern limericks that Leah wrote but correct me if I'm wrong there, there are just a couple of very early limericks which okay. sort of have a different um word for the final line but yeah. by far the majority and certainly once he settles into his 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 pattern he doesn't yeah. change as far and as I know let's go uh right over to Dominic now for the next two there was an old man with a beard who said it's just as I feared two owls and a hen Four larks and a wren have all built their nests in my beard. There was an old person of Chile whose conduct was painful and silly. He sat on the stairs eating apples and pears. That imprudent old person of Chile. The New Vestments. There lived an old man in the kingdom of Tess who invented a purely original dress. And when it was perfectly made and complete, he opened the door and walked into the street. By way of a hat, he'd a loaf of brown bread, in the middle of which he inserted his head. His shirt was made up of no end of dead mice, the warmth of whose skins was quite fluffy and nice. His drawers were of rabbit skins, but it's not known whose. His waistcoat and trousers were made of pork chops. His buttons were jujubes and chocolate drops. His coat was all pancakes with jam for a border and a girdle of biscuits to keep it in order. And he wore over all, as a screen from bad weather, a cloak of green cabbage leaves, all stitched together. He'd walked a short way when he heard a great noise all sorts of beasticles, birdlings and boys, 
and from every long street and dark lane in the town, beasts, birdles and boys in a tumult rushed down. Two cows and a half ate his cabbage leaf cloak. Four apes seized his girdle, which vanished like smoke. Three kids ate up half his pancakey coat, and the tails were devoured by an ancient he-goat. An army of dogs in a twinkling tore up his port waistcoat and trousers to give to their puppies. And while they were growling and mumbling the chops, ten boys prigged the jujubes and chocolate drops. He tried to run back to his house, but in vain. Four scores of fat pigs came again and again. They rushed out of stables and hovels and doors. They tore off his stockings, his shoes and his drawers, and now from the housetops with screechings descend striped, spotted, white, black and grey cats without end. They jumped on his shoulders and knocked off his hat. When crows, ducks and hens made a mincemeat of that, they speedily flew at his sleeves in a trice and utterly tore up his shirt of dead mice. They swallowed the last of his shirt with a squall, whereon he ran home with no clothes on at all. And he said to himself as he bolted his door, I will not wear a similar dress any more, any more, any more, any more, never more. Dominic West there. Thanks to him, as always, reading uh, Lear's The Vestments. Um, so before before we cut to, um, to audience questions, and uh, there is still time to submit one if you haven't yet, in the window that you're watching, and there'll be a, uh, there's a box beneath, and uh, please do submit some. We've had some fabulous questions already, but, uh, but please do sling more in. This is maybe going to be the greatest uh, concatenation of Lear experts, uh, I would say, anywhere in the world this year. I'm going to go out on a limb. Um, Sarah, there may be conferences that you're aware of that I'm not, but um, <laughs> before we cut back to that, I do want to briefly talk about Leah as a as a painter, um, because I, I find this really interesting. You know, the, the fact that he, I mean, it meant he didn't actually intend, I believe, originally to publish his nonsense, um, which I find fascinating. And, you know, what his view of himself was, did, did it change much over his life, um, Sarah? Yes, I mean, um, Lear made his living all his life, really, from his visual art. I think that's the important thing to say that at first, as a as a as zoological and ornithological painter of of extraordinary skill, mm -hmm. and then mostly as a landscape painter. Um, but he published um, his book of nonsense anonymously. I mean, who's Derry Down Derry, who who um, was was trying to make little folk merry, and he was quite tickled. Uh, they one sense is perhaps slightly hurt in later life that people um, thought it might be by somebody else. They might actually they thought it might be by his patron, the Earl of Derby, <laughs> actually, and that Leo was just an anagram of Earl. Um, uh, so Leo did change in various ways. And one of the ways I think that he changed was that towards the end of his life, I think he understood that nonsense would be the thing he was most remembered for. And, and he was ambivalent about that, but he, he also knew it wasn't a little thing either to, to make little folk merry. I, I do feel like you'd be surprised today, the, the, the sheer weight that's, that's put up, because he... His, as you say, his visual art, I mean, he, his paintings, his ornithological paintings were so good. He, he had three parrots named after him, I believe. I think it was in life as well. Um, and he taught, he taught Queen Victoria drawing and painting. Yeah. Amy, you're nodding. Do you, do you know a little about this? Uh, vaguely. Uh, yes. Um, she really enjoyed his illustrated excursions in Italy, um, which I believe was published in 1846. And he... Um, delivered a series of 12, I think, um, drawing lessons for her. And some of those drawings that she um, did under his tutelage are at Windsor Castle, I believe. Um, so, really? you know, he's, he's, he's such a good artist. Um, also that, I mean, I think when you Google Leah now, the first thing or other, <laughs> other search engines are available. Um, I think that uh, the first thing that comes up is that he's an artist rather than a, an author, uh, you know, a nonsense poet the first thing that comes up is for his art which i think is fascinating when we do primarily as you say think of him now as a as a nonsense poet he he famously um called queen um, victoria a deer and absolute duck <laughs> <laughs> to her face or 
an indescription of her, but she she seemed to like him very much. But they had a slight, uh, one slightly awkward moment when he asked her where she'd got all these beautiful things because she showed him some of her private collection, to which she replied, I inherited them, Mr. Lear. Mm, off in the way, off in the way with royals. Um, yeah, he, he, I just find this life extraordinary. I mean, it, it's a... You know, from from his childhood, which does seem to have contained a, a, a quite a quotient of unhappiness, to his you know early years, he started as a teenager doing his ornithological paintings, through the nonsense, through to the as you say the landscape paintings and and all the music of his later years, um, and all of his travel as well. And he lived a very uh, geographically adventurous life, I would say, uh, especially for a man of his time. Um, yeah, I mean. He kind of went everywhere, and uh, and seems to have been popular in most of those places. Although he was once, I I want to say stoned by a crowd. He went outside uh, with some drawing materials and uh, and was was greeted, I think, rather with more hostility than. Uh, um, where was that? Albania, I believe it was. Um, I think he was not wearing his fez. And he was drawing and that, that prompted. So anyway, early negative review for Lear. Very unusual in that sense. Um, so, okay. But so that's, that's the painting side of him, which I, I, I just find extraordinary. Is there, is there anything that ties all of these elements of his life together? Uh, would any of you say, I mean, that's, that's asking for a unified field theory of Lear, which there doesn't have to be because as um, Noreen, as you said, he, you know, contains so many of these different elements. Um, but if anyone is willing to to pitch up and say they've got the key, I'd love to know the theory. As adventurous as possible as well. Mm, I'm getting no bids. <laughs> well, it was, it was, um, it was, it was really, <laughs> it was really fantastic to read the last of the octopods because certainly as I was reading that I was like oh my goodness like it's really hitting all the Lear notes maybe that's the unified theory of <laughs> Lear um, because you've got everything you've got the kind of difficulty with how we live alongside each other I think they sing as well in the last of the as, as they go down the mountain am I remembering correctly anyway there's some sort of musical ritualized musical lamentation and best of all you've got that very Learish um ingredient, um, which is food. I mean, so often food is a sort of plot device in Lear, certainly in his limericks, you know, uh, they dine on mints and slices of quince in the, the Owl and the Pussycat, the food's always falling on the on the rhyme words. And here, food has this incredibly dramatic role in The Last of the Octopods, doesn't it? Because um, it's that that kills all the baby octopods, you know, they, uh, and Lear as well loves mixing weird foods together. And here it's the mixing of weird, and sometimes it goes very well. And um, there's a lovely, lovely bit in the letter where he writes to his friend saying, um, I don't have any, anything to feed you, but I'm going to get some olives and some sort of spiders from my cellar and I'm going to mix <laughs> them all up and it'll make a, a nice, if not nutritious, jelly. So, but here it doesn't work, mixing them up all into a jelly. And here actually the mixing of weird things is catastrophic and it kills all the baby octopods. Um, so yeah, I, I think we are very, very lucky to have this this new po poem, which ties so well into all these major Leah concerns. Yeah. The, yeah. And the, the, oh, go on, Sarah. Sorry. No, I was just, I absolutely agree with everything that Noreen uh, has, has said. Um, but there's a word in, that's in the new poem, which is quite a favorite Leo word, and it's the word promiscuous, which doesn't, is not a, a word that we use in the same way today. Um, obviously, we tend to think of promiscuous as having a kind of sexual meaning, but in this period, it, it means jumbly, it means mingled, it means that all things tumbling down. A mixture, and in, in a way, maybe medley is the is the word. It is the unifying thing that actually the uh, the union of disparate things is is the thing that that is Lear. Um, yeah, that's that is fascinating because I, I mean I never really think about the line they dined on mints and slices of quince. I or when I do think about it, when I say it to myself, I focus on the quince, and I kind of forget <laughs> we've just had you know r whether raw or not mints thrown in earlier on in the line as a um as a kind of chaotic extra element and in fact just before we started this conversation sarah you were saying that very early on in his drawing career he drew an owl pussycat crossbreed 
Yes, um, that's right. In the 1830s, long before he actually writes the, the poem that we know about the island, the pussycat, in the 1870s, he's sort of imagining this hybrid creature that is partly owl and partly cat. Uh, you know, he's fascinated by mixtures um, and, and how that pans out. And he writes a sequel, quite a sad sequel, actually, to Owl and the Pussycat that most people have never read, um, where they actually, they have children. And, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> but the cat has uh, um, committed suicide, leave, leaving the owl to be a single parent. And all the little sort of females are, are, are cats and all, all the little boys are owls. Um, and, you know, it's, it's almost as if the sort of species as an expression of gender and, and perhaps a, a kind of crossing of gender. And it's another way in which Lear is, is you know, can feel quite modern sometimes. Um, God, that's interesting. And I, I have to say, I do think that lends a bit of, bit of credence to the idea that there's a fair old slab of darkness in Lear's uh, vision of the world, which is kind of making its way out at various points. Um, I think that is close to a unified field theory of, of, of Lear, the jumble. And the combination, the the unusual crossing of streams. I'm 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 going to stick with that. Um, right. So let's hear from uh, Rosemary, who says hello. Thank you all for your fascinating presentations and discussions of Lear. How influential do you think Lear's work was on Lewis Carroll's work? Is there evidence of Carroll reading Lear's work? Um, which is very interesting because I, w when you think of the runcible spoon, it's not, it's not a big hop and a leap to the portmanteau words of the Jabberwocky, the the slithy uh, toves, you know, um, all of the combinations. Say again, Amy. Oh, I just said frab just day. Yeah, a frab just day exactly. There's, the, do we know much about the relationship between them, if any? They, they did read each other's work, but interestingly, they mostly ignore one another. <laughs> or, or, uh, I think they, they, um, uh, there's a, a Lear let, letter or diary entry where he talks about the daily Jabberwock, um, you know, right. and meaning a newspaper. And, and you know, he's clearly read um, uh, the Alice books, but he, he doesn't really talk about it much. And I think we can also see the influence in in Carol, but it's it's quite subtle. Um, yeah, I think I think the there are things on the surface I think are really really similar. Um, but I think I don't know. I suppose again with the, the question of what what is a particular sort of nonsense doing? I think they, they set out to do quite different things. Like a lot of Carol's nonsense is really clearly satirical of of contemporary things that are going on at the time. Like maybe the most famous example is the Caucus race, where you all the creatures run around in a circle and there's no winners and all must have prizes. That feels very sort of pointed. And Lear is much less satirical directly in that way and much less pointed. Um, um, so yeah, it's it's it seems nonsense, but towards a very different end. That is really interesting. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, and that I, I think when certainly lay people like me think of these Victorian writers, the nonsense is, is a huge element of that, and it is one thing that makes the era feel quite modern. It's it, it's an era that where a lot of writers were unafraid to um, to be quite weird in their presentation of um, or to to find new combinations, to find new speciations, if you like. Um, um, but there's no time to get into the Darwinism element because I do want to go to another question. This actually is a, is a, a slightly factual one and it's a two-parter from Anthea Maybury. Um, the first uh, thing she says is that the late great Nicholas Parsons uh, performed a stupendous show called How Pleasant to Know Mr. Lear, uh, which was performed at Bury St. Edmunds. I don't know if you guys have been to Bury St. Edmunds. The theatre there uh, is Georgian and it's absolutely superb. And Noreen, thank you for the very subtle removal of your own personal foss. Uh, and cats are very welcome here, I think uh, is what he would have wanted. Uh, anyway, I do apologize. Anthea says, uh, is there any record of that show? Because it was superb. And um, that's something that you guys may know, you may not. Um, I don't myself, I'm afraid. Um, no, Anthea, I'm afraid we're not able to help you out there. I do apologize. Um, <laughs> But I might. I'm going to have a hunt after the after this ends and see if I can find it. Um, Just, I mean, I, I I'm afraid I don't know, Anthea. I'm so sorry. But um, the 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 kind of clip you almost heard but didn't quite hear um, is actually how pleasant to know Mr. Lear, which again we mostly know as a poem, a sort of 
um, ironic poem that Leo writes about himself, but he actually tells us the music it should be sung to. And so I was earlier hoping to play you a little sort of extract of, of how pleasant to know Mr. Leo with its accompanying music, but um, do not fear because you can actually find it. There's a, a website um, with um, www.edwardleosmusic.com you listen to any of the music and you can you can find it there oh excellent thank you Sarah that's brilliant um so Anthea I hope that I hope that answers uh that element of your question there is another part Anthea just says more about the paintings please so that's a a very pleasantly open-ended um query we can go wherever we like with this one um why the shift from the early ornithological stuff to landscape later on in his life because he, he he made a shift. I'm not sure when. 30s, 40s, maybe. Um, he says at the time it's because of his eyes. Uh, Leo was myopic from the time that he was really uh, a, a small child, and he he had to use what he called goggles. So you know, glasses that were the thickest uh, lenses that you could get at the time. And he says that he wants to become a landscape paint painter because he can't do the close work anymore. I think there were actually other reasons too. He was desperate to get away, to go to Italy. Uh, he also suffered from asthma. He, he wanted to get out of England. So when um, the Derbys of Nursley sort of offered him money to, to go to Italy and sort of become a landscape painter, he jumped at that opportunity. He completed about a thousand drawings when he traveled around India. Again, a, a pretty... Um you know, pretty adventurous journey for him to make at the time. And um, given his age, because he was he was getting on a little bit by then, I think he would have been maybe 50 or maybe not quite 50, actually. So, but again, so much traveling, you know, his solo tour of Albania, he lived in Rome for years and years and years. And then he would occasionally return to England, pick up a stack of new commissions and then <laughs> start carrying them out. So, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a really substantial element of his life. Um, I, I do want to move us on to another uh, question. Oh, I like this one. It's coming anonymously. It's, it's this. For such an outside figure, how do you explain Lear's enduring and international appeal? And would anyone like to take up cuddles on this one? Noreen. I suppose it's precisely because um, the reference of his poems are so sort of abstract and nonsensical and they don't seem pegged to any at any particular place um, with, you know, it, what's interesting with the new poem is that sort of direct invocation of Milan and strong men in that city being quite a weird exception. Um, even when and where place names are obviously mentioned, but obvious, often made nonsensical or completely detached from um, the places they're actually talking about. And so nonsense, I think, becomes something that can be completely, I don't know, universalized and, and that doesn't feel specific to a particular culture. Although, of course, it is. Of course, there are going to be things that are very specific to Englishness and English understand, understanding of how society works. Uh, but I think the big questions, again, that Leah is grappling with, you know, again, sort of for, from, for my money, how, how we live alongside each other. Yeah, I think there's a questions that cross cultural boundaries. I completely agree. I was just going to um, chip in briefly. The reason why um, Octopods is very sort of pinned to a location is because the Mandelas who um, he, he wrote to, um, he was summering with them, he met them at uh, Monte Generoso at the times and um, Mandela, Anthony Mandela, his father was a Italian refugee from Lombardy so that's also how that all kind of ties in it's very linked to the Mandelas and kind of where they were at the time um, uh, but yeah that is an exception as, as Noreen said um, but yeah I think Leo is universal, it's like Alice in Wonderland isn't it, everybody reads Alice in Wonderland mm. they're enduring um, as I said earlier, you know, I read them when I was a children with my, with my grandparents um I mean, my grandparents don't know anything about uh, what I do, really. But when I said to them, oh, you know, Edward Lear, you know, this, I found this poem. It's so exciting. They instantly both went, oh, they all love a pussycat. Mm. Um, and I just think it's something that endures all generations. Um, I think everybody sort of has heard of Lear on the periphery. They know um, poems like Owl and the Pussycat or his limericks. Um, I mean, it was National Limerick Day yesterday. It was Lear's 210th birthday. Um, and I mean, if you if you looked on if you looked on Twitter or somewhere like that, the amount of limericks that people were posting from accounts all over the world in different languages, um, it was it was amazing, really, really amazing, and, and so fun to see, I think. 
do 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 each of you have a and you don't have to have one a favorite of Lear's limericks or a um even a favorite of his poems but i i mean limerick the limericks are going to be shorter and more easily recitable now that which is why i ask for them oh well mine has to be of course bicycle icicle fair um, enough I would be <laughs> um i was actually i came in the british library where i am now um I came in earlier on to have a look at the at the poems again because it feels like such a long time since I'd mm. uh, seen them in real life and you know it, it it was so evocative seeing that seeing that small it's a very tiny tiny slip of paper it's probably only only about this big mm. um, with this little limerick on it it was just yeah amazing um, so I'm gonna have to say that one I think as the unearther you you absolutely have have the rights okay. the rights to that um, Noreen Sarah. Uh, my the one I always think of when I think about Lear's limericks is um, the old man of Whitehaven who danced a quadrille with a raven, uh, but they said it's absurd to encourage this bird, so they smashed that old man of Whitehaven. Um, and what I like about it is that you know it's got a terribly sad ending, but it's got beautiful illustration of a of a, a man and a raven, both sort of you know, the, the man the. The raven is spreading its wings and the old man is sort of spreading the tails of his coat. And for a moment, he looks a little bird-like. So he's sort of moving from man to bird in this moment of harmony. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. I feel like that quadrille is quite nonsensical as well, isn't it? It always makes me think of Alice in, Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> that as well. Yeah, it's certainly nonsensical uh, when I try to do one. Um, Sarah, any favourite favorite <laughs> limericks to bring us home? I... I I love the lyric uh, illustrations, particularly the one where you know there's a, there's somebody who's talking to a frog and they kind of momentarily become mirrors of one another, or even a man and a bee who's being terribly bothered by a bee, and and it's as if the man's pipe kind of becomes a proboscis, and that there are all these wonderful kind of mirrorings between humans and and creatures. But my very favourite uh, Leo poem is, I think, the Jumblies. Uh, I love the fact that, you know, they go out to sea and everybody says you know, it's going to be disaster going to sea in a sieve. And unexpectedly, um, they come to delight. You know, they come to this wonderful island where there are monkeys with lo lollipop paws and no end of Stilton cheese. And just this wonderful sense of abundance um of of things being possible that shouldn't be possible i think is, is what i come back to lyric for again and again that's absolutely marvelous and i think that's that sense of abundance is a is a wonderful note to end on because he has provided such abundance you know his thousands of drawings his hundreds of limericks his paintings everything about him seems to have seems to have kind of burst forth in this huge you know wonderful protuberance and you know extraordinary maybe he was the dong with the luminous nose all along um <laughs> i i um i think um that's a really lovely thought about Lear to end on thank you so much uh to all of the speakers uh, to amy wilcoxon um to uh, to noreen masud and to sarah lodge that has just been uh, what a treat to spend time talking and thinking about Lear. Uh, I do hope uh, those of you watching have enjoyed it. Hope that you're all feeling ready for a nice, runcible evening. And, uh, and with that, we'll all say uh, goodbye. Thank you so much for watching this. And we do hope you enjoy it and that it's encouraged you to pick up a bit of Lear. There was an old man on a hill who seldom, if ever, stood still. He ran up and down in his grandmother's gown, which adorned that old man on the hill. There was a young lady of Hull who was chased by a virulent bull, but she seized on a spade and called out, Who's afraid? which distracted that virulent bull. <laughs>